Major funding for this program has been provided by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Joffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Markham, LLP, Marcus and Millichap Real Estate Investment Services, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, The Moynian Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, Siami Development Inc., SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling Inc., RAL Companies and Affiliates, LLC, Spandrel Property Services, Urban American. Here we are. It's the fall of 2010. And, you know, there's this irrational exuberance, I feel, in the real estate market in New York City. Uh, but I don't know. I'm not sure where it's going. So what I've done today is brought four experts, or alleged experts, on the state of the real estate market to give us their perspective. My guests today include Jay Goldstein, chairman of the real estate practice at the accounting and consulting firm of Friedman, LLP. Uh, Will Obide, the president and CEO of Gemini Real Estate Advisors, the owners of the Gem Hotels and over 4 million square feet of retail. From the Garden State, uh, Jeff Rich, the uh, senior partner in charge of the real estate practice at the law firm of Genova, Burns, Gia Tomasi. And last but never least, my friend uh, Jeff Levine, a partner at the accounting and consulting firm of Margolin, Weiner, and Evans. So since I considered you a friend, I don't know why, and since you're probably as old as Mr. Goldstein and myself, <laughs> oh, great guru, how do you see the world today? Well, if we narrow down the We're world. We're going to narrow the world down to the real estate discussion. Okay. And can we narrow it down to New York to begin with? And when we talk of New no, York. No, no, no. We, we have Jersey over here. So we want to go in the region. All right, we'll start in New York, we'll go on the other side, and we'll talk about New Jersey. Okay. Okay. The New York market, we know, has hit bottom, and the issue is whether it's going on an uptick or not. We see activity within our clients and with people who are not our clients. There's action going on, there's rental going on, there's sales, there's construction being planned, because everybody's trying to <coughs> predict where are we going to be in three years. And there's that minor enthusiasm, and thank God, for foreign money as equity. There's a lot of private equity money looking around, dying to get into real estate. We talk of the pricing of real estate and these paradoxes that exist, that there's no product on the market because the price is too cheap. And yet we hear that they're buying properties at low cap rates and driving the price up. This doesn't fit. Clients of ours have been in the rental market, scrounging around for rent, certainly not what they were getting two and three years ago, and then getting prices on the sale they're building, which is based on an old pricing model that's still coming. But the end of the story is there's money available. Not our <clears throat> money, but a lot of foreign money. You know, Will, with regard to foreign money, you have foreign guests, foreign visitors. Mm -hmm. What Today, 
I mean, it's much brighter than when you've been on the show in the past when we were talking about the house hospitality market. The average daily rate is up, the occupancy is up, yep. and there are many, many travelers. We're, how much of the business today is foreign travelers? Yeah, well, it's uh, first of all, the New York market is about 15% up uh, on a rev par basis. So uh, overall, we think that's where the year will end up. Uh, 2010 over 2009 and we believe that looking forward to 2011 we're probably looking at another double digit rev park growth in terms of travelers to New York City um, we're slowly climbing back towards 48 million visitors um, our hotels we've seen about 50 percent business 50 percent leisure in terms of um, how much of that component is international uh, it has continued to uh, grow in the last year or so. I think the foreign traveler is coming back. Uh, certainly a weak dollar is helping that, and uh, provided the dollar stays weak, um, uh, we'll continue to see an influx of foreign travelers. Um, just to pick up the idea on the uh, foreign capital, I, I do think there is a lot of foreign capital that's currently investing in New York City and will continue to invest in New York. The biggest question in my mind remains the amount of capital coming from China. There's a lot of restrictions on the amount of capital and how it can come out of the country of China and that is slowly being worked out and uh, when that does get uh, worked out I think we're going to see a huge influx in the amount of Chinese capital coming in to New York. <clears throat> you know, when you talk about Chinese capital, one of the biggest lenders on large loans recently has been the yes. Industrial Bank of China. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I was with somebody last week. They told me that they were going to refinance a building on Madison Avenue. Mm -hmm. They're not going to the collateralized mortgage-backed securities market, and part of the participants include the Bank of China. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of deals from the Chinese over there. Well, absolutely. and. Uh, foreign banks that have previously been shut out to the New York market on the previous cycles as CMBS got <coughs> overheated as our uh, local and regional lenders uh, were lending uh, quite well to construction projects as well as stabilized projects. Now that those lenders, traditional lenders, have been uh, cooled off and uh, many are still uh, nursing their current book. We're going to see a lot of foreign lenders come into this marketplace, and the best way for them to pick up market share is by providing construction loans because no one else is willing, almost no one else, is willing to provide construction loans today. You know, what's happening in the, in the Garden State? I mean, construction is not taking place too much in New Jersey either. No, it's starting to pick up. There's not, a, um, there's not a lot of foreign capital that we see in New Jersey. It's primarily the New Jersey banks that are becoming more active in the market. Um, we're seeing more deals in the urban centers. Uh, we're starting to see some deals in Newark where uh, the lenders are in a position to fund uh, construction. There's the... Uh, potential between two sites in Newark for a, a major relocation of a corporate headquarters coming uh, probably within the next three to six months. <clears throat> now, is that a relocation from a different part of New Jersey Correct. or a part of Newark? Different part of New Jersey. Coming into Newark. Coming into Newark. Uh, they see opportunity in Newark. They see um, a great infrastructure. They see transportation. And they've earmarked Newark as, as the place where they want to be. I mean, the, 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 but there is still the that perceived perception that Newark has heavy crime. You know, when, when you have you know, when you have a murder or you have something like that and the press really knocks it, you know, about the kids getting shot, that, that has the effect on Newark. Now, that that discussion, if we went to certain parts of the South Bronx, are similar. You right. know, it's the question of where it's uh, where where it's perceived. That is a huge PR problem for the city of Newark. And I think that they've been working on it under Booker's administration. They've been trying to uh, uh, to, to tackle the problem, but also to address it through the press as to how a, a particular crime is reported. Rather than indicating it's from the North Ward or the Central Ward or from the city of Newark, uh, there are different ways to report that situation where, from the perspective of the public looking at Newark from the outside and looking at the possibility of an investment, it becomes more attractive if that press isn't there.
Yeah. Now you have two off. You have three offices. Four. Right four right. offices. Two but in you New have Jersey. two in New Jersey. Yeah. So, and you, I mean, you're based in Manhattan. How does your Jersey practice and your New York practice see the world today in the real estate community? Well, uh, we look at New Jersey as a completely different market. It's sort of, it doesn't go up a lot. And it really doesn't go down a lot. But it's a stable market, mm -hmm. and if it's not in an overbuilt situation, then you know to park some money. And if there's transactions going on, then you know it's not a bad place to be. But you're not going to ride the wave like you do in New York, and the wave goes down in New York, and the wave goes up in New York, and it goes up precipitously sometimes and down precipitously. I was speaking to a client the other day who owns a few large office buildings in New York. And he was telling me that two years ago he was getting, you know, 70 plus dollars a square foot. Almost overnight it went down to $55. And yet he couldn't get any long term leases, at, even at $55 with healthy work letters. And again, it happened over a three month period. Now, what's happening now is these, these three to five year leases, and he had a 10 year building effectively are now going to 10 years, but there's not an increase in the rent. It's really staying flat. And my next observation is I think, you know, in a long time with real estate, if you look at the tri-state area, maybe even the country, you know, people say we're on the trough, and I'm sure you've heard my comment, I think we're in an L-shaped situation, and the bottom of the L is there, and, you know, we're sort of wiggling along. And there are some good signs in the last few months I've seen. We've resuscitated our acquisition due diligence practice. We're currently doing seven acquisition due diligence engagements. That's a lot of activity for three months. And they're all over the country. They're not necessarily office building. Most are in uh, uh, residential as a favorite asset class and also some in uh, malls. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the activity is here, but yet the conversation is everybody's looking very carefully. You know, it's it's interesting. I, I flew in from Chicago yesterday, and I think one of the benefits for me when I'm traveling is I get a chance to read a little bit more than I normally read. And uh, I read a lot because I write these twice weekly articles and, you know, 10 10 wins and everything. And I read a very interesting report from Deloitte, hmm. and it was talking about uh, health care due to the new health care reform and the fact that health care is becoming more retail <coughs> oriented, much more retail oriented. And I was thinking because they said there are three types. There's the wellness where you know you go for smoking cessation and weight reduction. So the Jenny Craig, the Weight Watchers and that which is one part of the health care. Then there is a section where you go for uh, your uh, cholesterol tests and your flu shots. And looking around, you walk around Manhattan, I don't know if you see it in New Jersey, every Walgreens, every Duane Reed is now $29 for a flu shot. And then the third category was because of the hospital emergency room, <coughs> the outpatient clinics. And uh, Duane Reed recently opened up th four megastores, and out of the three of the four megastores, all have health care in it. Mm -hmm. And they have the dock in the box, open six to seven days a week. So the, the world is really, you know, it's, a, it's an That's interesting right. thing. I'm not familiar enough with it, but everything is marketing. Business stinks. How do you inspire business, come up with new ideas, new innovations, new marketing? One of the great things that happened between Cable Vision and Fox, there was a lot of advertising sold. <laughs> between, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you, it was just you also you have to remember Fox happened to control to the newspapers, so their advertising was controlled rather easy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the it, Journal and the Post. It, and as far as the dock in the box, I think that uh, we own a lot. Of, we own and manage a lot of retail, um, uh, mostly outside of uh, of the city. But you're seeing retail spaces need to look at alternative uses. The truth is there's probably uh, less than five retailers that I really trust right now. And um, it wouldn't surprise me if there are a number of additional retailers that have problems over the next few years. Uh, I think uh, I agree that we're in a prolonged recovery period. I think that um, you know this new normal, whatever it is, mm -hmm. 
um, is an environment where everyone has to uh, get used to lower returns. And that's something that a lot of the private equity money um, that is trying to make deals work in this environment doesn't want to hear. But the truth is the consumer is still on their back. Uh, even though their amount of debt service has come down over the last couple of years, uh, the consumer still isn't spending. Uh, businesses, especially small businesses, are hurting big time. Small businesses are getting absolutely no assistance from the federal government. Small businesses contribute 50 percent of all the jobs in this country, and they have no access to the credit markets right now. It's the Fortune 500 and large corporations that can access the public markets and the public debt. Those are the ones that are uh, getting the help that they need most readily, but the small businesses um, uh, are still really struggling. And we're seeing it in, uh, in all of our shopping centers that we own and manage across the country. It's the local and regional tenants that are struggling the most. And until the government finds a way to help those small businesses, we're going to have uh, a lot of problems. And there's no such thing as an easy 20 percent return anymore. So all the private equity money looking for a 20 percent IRR, they're still trying to buy all these uh, assets off these banks at 30 cents on the dollar. Banks aren't selling at 30 cents on the dollar. They want to sell at 70 cents uh, on the dollar. I, I and think there's the, a disconnect. I think there's a, it's a very big difference because banks are really not selling at 70 cents, they were even trying to get close to par. I happened to be with a bank last week uh, who was forced by the OCC to sell $200 million of loans four months ago at a 40% discount. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that he's working with the guys who bought at the hedge fund and he's going because he wants to show the OCC that they made an error because these loans are now being sold for close to par. And this is what's happening. You have clients who everybody wants to bottom fish. Everybody wants to buy okay. notes at a discount. And the bank says, I'm not there. I'm not doing this for you. You know, uh, interesting point on Jersey, which uh, related, you know, one of the big benefits that people were buying retail in New York was the under the $110 item for clothing. It was a big situation. Mm -hmm. You know, people uh, would run out to these tanker outlets and the other places, and they got hit by a 9% discount. Um, if New Jersey didn't have that exemption on clothing, I think uh, retail would be really hurting in New Jersey. Yeah, I think you're right. But, you know, it's interesting. Um, we are seeing a trend over the last probably two years with uh, big box retailers coming into New Jersey throughout the state, some that don't have a significant presence now have committed uh, substantial resources to site acquisition or uh, development, and we see quite a bit of that, primarily in Central. And um, Which type of big box retailers are you talking about? Uh, like the Walmarts and the Lowe's and the, that type. Um, we, we see a lot of that activity starting to grow, which uh, I think is going to just help uh, jumpstart the economy in those particular areas where they settle in. You know, the, the Walmart is, is, in a way, is like what I was talking about the Dwayne Reeds. Um, these new Dwayne Reeds that have opened are 16 to 20,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, I remember the drugstore where you, my father-in-law had a place, you know, they were open a certain thing, they considered them dock. Forty percent of the Dwayne Reeds today have fresh food. You walk in there, they have Starbucks sure. coffee, they yep. have bakery items, because they have become the convenience store. They yeah, have, they've, they've really taken... diversified their product lines over the yeah. past few years. You know, years. Michael, you spoke about irrational exuberance earlier on. And I think what, what's happening now, we're at the bottom of the cycle and we're going like this, but the thing we haven't mentioned is the very basic thing of jobs. And I'm not so sure unemployment <coughs> is going to stay where it is and not spike up somewhat. And if it does, all of the plans for retail and so on, you know, things sort of but, change But I think what Will quickly. said before was very <coughs> to the point. You know, people aren't spending. You know, uh, there's a lockdown. discussion. It's locked down, you know, uh, Black Friday sales, which normally take place, you know, the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, many of the chains are, have started it already, for mm -hmm. the, you know, in the beginning of November. So there's a different type of situation over there. The retailers are going to heavily discount again this holiday season. And uh, even if there are new boxes that get built, you still need the consumer to come That's back. Exactly and right. the consumers in lockdown, 
small businesses are in lockdown, and we still have, what, uh, over 8 million unemployed in this country. Until those people get back to work, all this activity that we see or we think we see really doesn't mean a thing. That's exactly the point. And what do, you, what do your clients see? And what do they want to do today? It comes down to spending, and I think we're getting a lot of misinformation and possibly disinformation emanating out of, the, out of our government. There was a report throughout the summer that can, the average American was saving more money. How could that be? I mean, if you take mass America, I think they're in hock up to their ears, starting with their car leases, their master charge, their visa, maybe their J.C. Penney card. And then about a month ago, they finally came out with how they came up with that stat. They went to all the banks that are holding credit card debt. And they said the credit card debt was lower than it had been in the past. That was after the reserves. So as they wrote down the debt, all of a sudden they said, well, they must be spending more. And the line that goes with it is that consumer confidence was up, but confidence in consumers were down. And if there is no confidence in that consumer spending money, nobody's doing anything. We talked to bankers. They said nobody's coming through the door to borrow. We're talking about the small guy to borrow money, the small businessman, because he's not investing anything in his business. He doesn't see it. Our government gives us a special deduction. We can write off capitalized expenditures now. All right? They've raised the limit. Who's putting money in? Uh, so it's ice in the winter time. You, you, know, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I did a 10-10 wins, and I even spoke to my son about it the other day. There's the capability of getting this $1,500 tax credit for uh, energy-efficient places. Uh, you see some ads, but it's not really publicized. And, you know, and I, I, I explained to my son, I said, he's a school teacher and his wife's a dermatologist. I said, this is a credit, not a deduction. This is a credit. And you need a new furnace or you need a new hot water, it's the best time. But I think it relates to what you're saying. People aren't spending. Well, it, it's very simple what, what the government needs to do to stimulate this economy. Lower taxes and reduce government spending. Two years of that. Two years <coughs> of, of lower taxes and reduce government spending and we'll be out of this thing. Uh, but unless there is a really concerted effort and Washington needs to stop this anti-business, anti-Wall Street mentality. Uh, you know, these are career politicians that uh, uh, really have never run a business, and they're making statements and rhetoric that is very anti-Wall Street, very anti-business. But, but anti you know, uh, I, I hear some nice comments about Chris Christie. You know, th this guy, Corzine, was the businessman. Corzine was great. But Corzine ran a miserable government. The, every landlord and every real estate person I know who was on my show for the last couple of years, when Corzine was on, hated it. You know, they wouldn't go there. And now New Jersey is pro. I mean, this is what Booker has done a little bit in Newark, and right. I think it's happening over there. You know, it's, it's all the positive. Hey, New York City has done better because of Bloomberg. Absolutely. You know, there, there, there is no question that we have to look at it in that way. A couple of years ago, State of Israel came out with this new concept. They want to invite all Israelis that have left Israel to come back into the country, and we won't tax you on your foreign income. Because Israel only taxes their residents, not their citizens. Where in our country, we work the reverse. We need money, we tax you more. They wanted to get the Israelis living overseas, come back in, spend money in the country, and cr help the economy and our taxation system, to pick up on what you said, Will, it just goes the other direction. Yeah. It just goes out, doesn't come back in. America is one of the countries, <clears throat> one of the few countries uh, that has a worldwide global tax system. Yes. So anyone that lives abroad or makes money abroad, you owe taxes on whatever income you generate abroad. And it, think about incentives. We need to be incentivizing uh, Americans to save more. So I think we need to move towards a flat tax or a uh, European VAT style tax uh, where it more heavily uh, taxes spending rather than income.
That flat tax is going to put him and me out of business. <laughs> <laughs> Candidly, I no, would no, be no. unhappy with that. It's so complicated now. <laughs> so so yeah. let's look at it this way. Where do you see in your crystal apples over there 2011? I'm not quite as optimistic as many. I think we're going to be in this long extended bottom to the recession, the L. And it's going to go a little bit like this. Yeah, but you did say that uh, you got seven assignments that, by companies looking to correct. do acquisitions. But there's a do. lot of trepidation in the conversation with them, you know, was, you know, we may pull a plug at any time with this stuff. We're looking very close at everything we do and the economy. And if they sense, uh, you know, a bad time, they're going to stop doing what they're doing. Now, the other side is things could be okay and they could keep acquiring but the other side is they're really looking carefully and I'm really concerned about the unemployment I think that that's really the the thing that's holding uh, us over and your comment about lowering taxes we all know that's not going to happen but I agree with you hundred percent that really makes a lot of sense Mr. Yeah. Ovide, sure. 2011 real estate world I'm not very optimistic that there's going to be significant improvement in the economy so I think it's about uh, finding real estate projects that makes sense, uh, but um, I think it's going to be an operator-led uh, recovery where um, real estate companies need to leverage their operational capabilities uh, in whatever field they operate in. Jeff? Cautiously optimistic <clears throat> for 2011. I think we're, we're starting to climb out of the, uh, the hole that we have put ourselves in over the past few years. I think the expectations were that we would start that climb earlier and be on our way out now. I think we're just starting the climb. Uh, I think a lot is going to be uh, governed by whether Chris Christie's programs take hold and become effective and we'll see that probably within the next six to twelve months. All comes down to Washington. If they can spread the news and give people faith, I think you get yourself out of it. If it comes out negative and we have the elections and nothing happens, then you stay in it. Really that way? Yeah. Because I think it's all mind over matter. I really do. You're going to spend if you think the times are getting better. So, uh, I, you know, in summation, uh, you know, there's cautious optimism. It, it looks that way. You know, there may be more spending. You know, there may, you know, look, I'm not a politician. I fortunately have with doing 350 shows, have probably had maybe two or three politicians ever, because that's the type of show I don't want to do, political. But hopefully um, your views will, uh, will show some positive results next year. And I hope to see all of you back next year. I'd like to thank uh, Jay Goldstein, Will Abai, Jeff Rich, and uh, Jeff Levine. See you next week. Major funding for this program has been provided by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Joffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Markham, LLP, Marcus and Millichap Real Estate Investment Services, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, The Moynian Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, Siami Development Inc., SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling Inc., RAL Companies and Affiliates, LLC, Spandrel Property Services, Urban American.